Pink noise? White noise? What is all this noise, anyway? I'm Professor Fiore, and I'm going to explain it to you right now. And so we begin our discussion on noise, different kinds of noise, how you can morph one kind of noise into another kind of noise. And we begin with something called white noise. White noise is random signals across the spectrum that has constant power per hertz. In other words, you can think of a span of frequency that's, let's say, 100 hertz wide, and there would be the same amount of energy in there, whether it's from 100 to 200 hertz, or 1,000 to 1,100 hertz, or from 10 kilohertz to 10.1 kilohertz. That's the way that works. Similar to this is something called pink noise. That has constant power per octave. So if I'm looking at one octave, which is a factor of two, like 100 hertz to 200 hertz, or 500 hertz to 1,000 hertz, there's constant power octave to octave to octave. Clearly, these are not the same thing, and it turns out that the difference between them is a 3 dB, 3 dB per octave slope. Now, where do the names come from? Well, the names actually, actually come from sort of an allusion to uh, optics, to light, right? We think of white light as having all frequencies in there, right? Sort of equally balanced, more or less. That's not exactly true, but that's what we're going to use for our basic, you know, common man sort of definition. Now, pink noise gets its name because it has a greater preponderance of energy at the lower frequencies. In other words, the base frequencies versus the treble. So that's kind of like with light, the base frequencies would be um, analogous to red light, the longer wavelengths. And then you would have, of course, less in the blue end, the treble end. So if you think in terms of it being red heavy, that's like looking at the color pink, right? Pink is basically white with a little bit of red mixed into it. So that's where the name comes from, right? We call it pink noise. And pink noise is actually, um, a decent approximation to certain kinds of noise sources that you're familiar with as a human being in the natural world. In other words, um, examples would be like wind in the trees or standing next to a waterfall. And many people think of pink noise as being kind of um, calming in a way. White noise, on the other hand, is a little bright by comparison. It can be a little harsh. Although it is used in some cases as a noise masking uh, background. We'll put a little white noise, you know, for example, in an office so that the person in the next, you know, cubicle, um, it's harder for them to hear what you're doing in yours and vice versa. Okay. Now there's a really interesting sort of twist here, which is sort of a major issue in this video that I want to address. And it's not immediately apparent. But the idea is this, if you take a simple RC network, or for that matter, an RL network, basically a first order network, they fall at a rate of 6 dB per octave or 20 dB per decade. If the difference between white noise and pink noise is 3 dB per octave, how is it possible to turn white noise into pink noise? Is it possible? Well, certainly it is possible because the name of this thing is pinking filter, so it must be possible, right? Otherwise, this is a really short video. The trick here really is you can't do it with a single RC network. Of course, we would rather RC than RL. Inductors are not as well behaved as caps, so we always try to use caps when we can. But in any case, what we have to do is use multiple RC networks and have networks load prior networks so that there's partial cancellation. If we do this correctly, we can get a nice 3 dB per octave effective slope. Now, it won't be perfect, 
But really, it only takes about three or four sections to get a pretty nice result. And by pretty nice result, what I mean is the filter I'm going to show you is accurate if the components were perfect to within about plus or minus one quarter of a dB. So, you know, that's pretty good. And ultimately, this now sort of begs the question about, well, where do I use this? What's the point of having a pink noise source other than maybe it'll help me fall asleep? You know, if there's a, a noise on my, um, in, you know, in my bedroom, outside on the street, my next door neighbors, you know, whatever the heck it is, some people do that. The classic example is using it to EQ a playback system, like a monitoring system, or even your home stereo. What you would do is you would feed pink noise into the uh, amplifier. This will now come out through your loudspeakers. And then what you do is at the listening position, you take a nice calibrated measurement microphone, very flat response, and you hook that into a real-time analyzer. And now you turn on the noise source, turn up the amplifier, and you look at the RTA. If the system, if the playback system is perfectly flat, then the RTA will show a nice flat line, all levels, right? If it's not, right, if you see, you know, one of the bands being a little higher than the other, then you go over to your equalizer. So you might have, in this case, a, a one-third octave, you know, uh, graphic style EQ, and you adjust that until the response on the RTA is perfectly flat. Now you have a tuned system, off you go. And you would do this separately on each channel, Right channel and left channel aren't necessarily, you know, identical, so we would do that separately. And we now have a nice flat system. Playback is, you know, as close to ideal as we can get. How complicated is the filter? Well, it turns out the filter is actually fairly straightforward. Now, I first saw a circuit like this in an old National Semiconductor Audio Handbook from the 1970s, back when I was a student. Um, that's essentially where this comes from. And I've seen this repeated in various places over the years, sometimes with slightly different values, but this is a very common one. So, you know, I don't know if it's sort of replicated from that old National Semiconductor book or not, but there it is. You can see that basically we have uh, three simple RC networks here. The double cap is here to try and get the precise value of capacitance. 247s, because you want ultimately 94 nanofarads here, because um, 94 is not a standard value. If you throw in a 91, which is the nearest standard value to 94, there will be a little bit more deviation, but I have uh, simulated this, checked it out. The deviation goes off no more than about two tenths of a dB. So if you did that, instead of saying this whole thing is, you know, plus and minus a quarter, it'd be closer to plus and minus half a dB. Eh, you know, it's not a big deal to get 247s, all right? Practically speaking, what I would do is I would buy 1% precision resistors here, like metal film resistors, and then for the caps, I would get nice film caps, 5% film caps, buy a couple of each, you know, buy three, four of each. Get out your cap meter, and if you don't have one, you know, cap meters are pretty cheap and measure them, find the one that's closest to the target, and then use that, all right? So the um, only caveat here is that the input impedance to the following stage should be considerably larger than, than uh, the values that we have here, the impedance values that we have. Otherwise, it's going to create further loading, and that'll warp the curve. So on my testing, if Zn is uh, greater than a megohm, you should be great, all right? Beauty, beauty, beauty. Okay, now let's take a look at the AC analysis on this, just to show you what this looks like. All right, so I'm gonna run from 10 up to 100 kilohertz, take a look at what's going on here. Boom, all right, so here's our curve. Now you can see it's not perfectly flat, there are some small deviations in here, but really, it's not bad. Now, remember what I said, this is 3 dB per octave, which turns out to be 10 dB per decade. So I'm just going to grab a cursor over here, grab a couple of uh, convenient decades. So let's go to 100 hertz there. That's a nice one. 
right? So I've got 99.55, and I'm down at minus 11.9, nearly minus 12. Now let's go to 1K. See how close I can get to 1K here. That's right on 1K, so that's 21.8. All right, 21.8, and we were at, what was it? <laughs> My memory. Uh, I know it was just about 12. So yeah, 11 minus 11.9, uh, right? You go up another 10-ish dB, and you know, there. I mean, there we are, right? It's minus 21.8. So we're off by like a tenth of a dB at the extremes. But that is showing you just what the uh, you know, average slope here is, right? And it's supposed to be, like I said, ideally 3 dB per, right? Per octave, uh, 10 dB per decade however you want to look at that, all right? Okay, the input to this is white noise, which brings up the obvious question, where am I going to get a white noise source? Well, you can buy one, right? I mean, you can go out and get a handheld white noise source, um, but, you know, you can use something like this, right? You can build your own. Now, to be honest with you, I have not tested this. I have not built this. Why haven't I built this? Because I actually have a nice white noise source of my own which also generates pink noise. I don't really need it, but I know some of you want to build these things. So this actually came from EDN, EDN Magazine from uh, September of 2013. And EDN is one of those magazines, you know, engineering uh, industry magazines. I would say EDN along with electronic design, you know, those were the high points. I would read those, you know, during my career when those issues would show up, you know, I would pour through them. Uh, year after year after year, you know, month after month, I, these things would come in and I would read them. Really good stuff, very high quality, you know, interesting circuits, new developments, things like that. But in any case, this this was out there in 2013. The author um, talks about this use, utilizing a Zener, reverse biased, reverse biased Zener. Zeners are not known to be super low noise, right? So he's actually exploiting that here. Two 9-volt batteries set this up. This creates a reverse bias on the Zener, and there's a noise voltage here, which ultimately is amplified by a little op amp, right? In this case, he's using a, a 412 with a gain of, you know, about 10, and then that just goes out. Now, interestingly, you this is sort of counterintuitive, but you actually want low noise op amps. Huh? It's a noise source. Why do I want a low noise, you know, low noise op amp? Because chances are the noise produced by the op amp isn't white noise. So this noise is additive to this noise. End result, you won't have a nice pure white noise output. So you actually want the noise on this to be lower, considerably lower, than the noise you're getting from your noise uh, source, as in the Zener. Okay? So, there you go. Right. So out of here, you're going to have this, um, this white noise which is about one volt peak to peak. But I have to caution you, noise signals, the, the what we call the crest ratio, which is the ratio between the peak and the RMS, can be pretty big. Even a band-limited white noise generator, you know, for like audio band, crest ratio can easily be 10 to 1. So your peaks can be 10 times higher than, you know, what your RMS value is. Um, you know, people kind of get into the habit of thinking peak RMS Oh, that's, you know, 0.707, you know, 1 over the square root of 2. That's the, that's the ratio. Yeah, for a sine wave, but not for other waves, you know. And noise is one of, those, one of those that can have a really high crest ratio. All right, so using this nice handheld thing, two 9-volt batteries, you can now run this into the filter. But, of course, because it has a 3 dB uh, per octave roll-off, you're not going to have 1 volt peak-to-peak -peak of pink noise. So you really want another amplifier stage, right? So this back here would be your, your white noise generator that we just looked at. We're going to run this through the pinking filter that we were talking about initially. And then we're going to have another output stage, again, a gain of about uh, 10, to um, sort of make up that lost signal. All right. And again, the output will be somewhere in the vicinity of, you know, 1 volt peak to peak. All right. Now, if you're wondering about the sound... Like if you've never heard white noise versus pink noise, what I've done is for my source, I'm using a WAV file. And I'm using a white noise WAV file. 
So, because you're not going to find that directly in, uh, in Tina. So, you know, it has sines and, tri and triangles and squares and stuff like that. But you can generate a white, uh, white noise signal, and I did that in my sample wrench um, audio editor analyzer software. I just generated a four-second uh, white noise source, hauled it in here. So now when we do an analysis, we can hear the difference. Okay? All right, so let's do that. I'm going to just do a little transient analysis over here. Four seconds. Wait for it to do its thing. And there we go. Now, you can see roughly these are about the same size. You can see some peaks going up beyond the other one. You have the red versus the green. But I am going to uh, separate the curves so we can see them. All right, so the green is the VN. And it just looks solid because, you know, there are so many squiggles in here. They just all form together. Um, the V out, on the other hand, you know, has been, has been filtered. There's not as much high frequency. So um, you don't quite see that same effect. But, you know, like I said, the average around here is going to be, again, about a volt. So, you know, these are probably going to sound around as loud as each other, give or take. But let's just listen to what the white noise sounds like. All right. All right. So that's, you know, kind of hissy. There's certainly a, a fair amount of high end on there. In comparison, you check out the pink noise. Then when I listen to that, you know, I hear, I definitely hear more bass. It's more of a rushing sound. And to me, when I hear this sound, I'm immediately brought back to standing next to a waterfall. All right. So that whole idea of, you know, the natural sound source um, really hits home for me. All right. You might hear something a little bit different. Your experiences are different, but that's the basic idea. All right. So we now have number one courtesy of EDN, a signal uh, generator, a white noise generator, which you can use on, a, on your own. And then we can run that into our pinking filter with a little makeup gain stage and bingo, produce pink noise. Now, these are both running off plus and minus nine. So you can take that first circuit plus this, okay? Put it on a little PC board. You got two nine volt batteries. You have one output, you know, which would have been back here, so to speak. Uh, for the, for the um, uh, white noise, and then you'd have this for the pink noise. If you do exactly that, then you won't necessarily need this 1K. You can run from here right into here. If you throw the 1K in there, because basically that 1K was out there just as a limiting resistance, um, but that's going to kind of mess up the filter if you have it with this um, R1 of 6.8. So you can just deep six that. If you're going to use, use them as separate devices, well, you know, that's different. Well, it depends on what else you're using it um, along with. Okay, great. So, white noise, spectrally flat, equal energy per unit hertz. Pink noise has more low frequency content. It's equal energy per octave or decade, however you want to think of, think of that in terms of ratios of frequency. All right, both useful for measurement. Okay, this is Professor Fiori saying, see you next time. Take care.